And we are live. This is Fight Commentary Breakdance here. I got a very, very special guest. This is Ryan. Ryan's an alma mater from my school. <laughs> so this is going to be the second alum from my school. If you guys wonder the type of student that goes to the University of Pennsylvania, the type of student <laughs> that becomes president of the United States, it's like me and Ryan. So welcome, Ryan. <laughs> <laughs> hey, guys. And hey, what's up, Jerry? Guys, um, Ryan's done taekwondo for more than a decade, and he also has experience doing karate or karate and boxing. So, Ryan, it's really cool to have you on. You're the second Taekwondo person on. Um, tell us about your martial arts journey. Yeah, I think um, it really started, I suppose, so my family, <clears throat> so I'm Vietnamese, I mm -hmm. guess that's the way to start off. So my family um, in Vietnam, they, I think most of the men in my family in Vietnam, even a couple of the women, too, they've all had some level of martial arts training. I think it was just sort of like, I don't know, the thing that my family really liked to do, uh, according to my dad, a lot of our training was in Va Vietnam, which is the Vietnamese like martial arts, as well as um, some sort of street level. The, the Viet words that he used tr roughly translate to like Shaolin or um, I think Northern Shaolin boxing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so we have a lot of um, experience or love for martial arts. So then when I came over to America and like, you know, um, not to be a little bit depressing about it, but you know, there was racism mm -hmm. when I came over as well as sort of like, I lived in a neighborhood that was sort of minority heavy and there was all these conflicts. So my dad thought it might be good to like uh, send me to learn Taekwondo and mm -hmm. that's how it kind of all started. Um, yeah, so I would go after school every day, every other day, depending on how much work I had. Um, usually I would go every day because well, you were young, but then once high school hit, it was every other day. Yeah. Of course, extracurriculars. But yeah, so I learned a, as much Taekwondo as to do it as possible. I think I was a, I was a bigger fan of sparring and actual like um, combat than um, the forms or the patterns that occurred. Uh, I think that part annoyed me the most, especially whenever you had to do testing and then they were like, you got to remember the names of the patterns and the meanings. And I was like, I don't really want to, <laughs> but yeah. <laughs> Because to me, that was sort of like a, a thing that didn't really matter as much. Like, um, yeah, so I did. So I, I stopped doing Taekwondo like officially uh, once college began. So I've only, I'm only a second degree black belt in Taekwondo, but um, that's only because I stopped testing. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, so I've also done tournaments, sparring tournaments mm -hmm. um, against other Taekwondo practitioners. And there were two tournaments I went to that were regionals that had people who use karate, Muay Thai, uh, Brazilian Jiu-Jitsu, and I placed, I think, third or fourth in that. Mm. Um, yeah, so I think most of it was, it started off as self-defense, but then I started really getting into the like whole like fighting aspect of it, wow. and to sort of supplement um, the, the lack of like primarily like hand, 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 comp, you know, mm -hmm. the upper body sort of hand movements that come from um, Taekwondo. I took a bit of boxing classes, but there was just a local boxing gym in the neighborhood. Mm. I ran by an, um, an old, an older guy, I think in his 60s, and his two sons. So I went there and just trained on the bag uh, with, you know, all punching techniques, hook combos, um, jabs. And then um, I, I took up karate just because sort of like an insistence from my friend mm -hmm. who was doing karate and it was part of it was just a, like so I could like practice with my friend mm -hmm. and the other part of it was to sort of branch out on the types of um, kicks and strikes that uh, Taekwondo doesn't have. Wow. Yeah. So um, pretty interesting already. Um, were, did you do ITF Taekwondo or WTF Taekwondo? Do you remember what the branch was? I think it was ITF. ITF, okay. Makes I'm not sense. exactly sure because I never really paid attention to those classifications because mm -hmm. that was not my sort of like... I wasn't really learning Taekwondo to understand the like background history mm -hmm. so much as to understand how to maneuver yeah. and fight an opponent. Yeah, <laughs> like you had a specific purpose which was you lived in a community where potentially you might get into a fight. So you were really learning well, to prepare it was, it yourself. Wasn't just, it wasn't just potential. Oh, I, it's like I mean, you definitely fights, got into fights. Often. Wow. <laughs> yeah. Tell me about some of that, man. Um, like, I'll, I'll just briefly tell you, like, um, in my experience, like the racism I've experienced, it's almost yeah. always from Hispanic people growing up. Like, 
Black people usually don't give me anything, and white people usually don't give me anything. Jewish people may slightly, but it's usually Hispanic people. Like, what was the type of, like, um, kind of, like, that kind of, like, conflict that so, you experienced? Um, the, the racial minority divide in um, my neighborhood, it was, so it was heavily African American, mm -hmm. <clears throat> with um, some sprinkles of Hispanics. Um, there was one Indian family, but they moved out about like a year or two after I got there. I got to like the neighborhood. I moved to the neighborhood. Um, but I, me and one, my family and one other family were the only two Asians in the neighborhood. Wow. Luckily, the other family was Vietnamese. Mm -hmm. So um, we had like like a friend, like a family friend sort of thing to um, mm -hmm. work with us. But the racism primarily kid came from the white kids and the African American kids. Mm -hmm. Because there, there was a strange sort of thing. I think if you like, if, the more you study about racial history, it, it, it boils down to being like, you know, white people want Asians to assimilate to sort of like, because they see, you know, us as hardworking. Mm -hmm. they, they see us through the lens of the modern, model minority myth, right? Mm -hmm. And then so they kind of want us on their side. Well, African-Americans see us just as a minority mm -hmm. and they want to sort of pull us on the other side. Mm -hmm. So conflicts arose whenever I... Personally, I don't care who you are. If you're nice to me, I'm gonna hang out with you. Yeah. And if you want to play hoops or something, like that's what I'm gonna do. Mm -hmm. But like, there were instances where, you know, these two racial groups would be like, "Yo, Ryan, why are you hanging out with these black kids?" Or "Yo, Ryan, why are you hanging out with these white kids?" Right? And conflict and argument would rise, and then fights would break out. Wow. And I think like that's how it first started. And my dad was like, "Oh man, this is sort of like there's sort of this sort of racial angst that's happening in the community." Mm -hmm. um, and then it, they got exasperated because if I would start hanging out with the white kids, they would re recall like, yo, you were hanging out with that group of black kids the other day. Why? Like, oh. And then they would start picking on me. So there was one time I went to like, I was, I, I don't think I was really invited, but I was quote unquote invited to a pool party. And when I got there, we were hanging out and like sort of having fun. And then, you know how kids do, they play like a dunking game, you know yeah. how like they yeah. like to yeah. dunk that? Yeah. But then uh, it got pretty vicious with a couple of these older like they were like two or three years older than me and they were like actually like trying to hurt me through like this game they like they dumped me and held me underwater and stuff so like there was a lot of racial tension from that going on and then if i hung out with the african-american kids like they wouldn't let me on the basketball court sometimes wow you know? or like they wouldn't let me play in the field or they'll just like bully me off the field so wow yeah um, and so when you stepped in that taekwondo class for the first day do you still remember that first day your first class <coughs> <laughs> yeah, um, I think I remember the first day because, so I was lucky enough to, so my neighborhood is adjacent, so we're sort of like in this like lower income neighborhood, mm -hmm. or I moved out, so um, I used to live in this lower income neighborhood, but it was adjacent to a neighborhood that was like upper middle class, sort mm -hmm. of like high class, like I'm talking kids with families who are lawyers and doctors, mm -hmm. so like, we always, and strangely enough, they all live up a hill, sort of like like a foresty area. So we were literally at the bottom of the hill. Like wow. the lower income kids were literally like at the foot of the hill, while the, all the high income kids were at the top of the hill. So I was lucky enough that because we were sort of clumped together, like school district wise in this area, the Taekwondo like studio incorporated everybody. So when I went there, right, like you were no longer like one of the poor kids. Mm -hmm. You were no longer one of the rich kids. You were just one of the kids trying to learn and master this sort of like form of martial arts, right? So it felt good to see like, you know, white kids, African American kids, Hispanic kids, all these kids come together and just learn and forget about racial ties and angst and just practice, you know? So I think it felt a little bit inspiring and a little bit sort of like competitive because I was just like, oh, if I can, if now, I, if I finally have my even playing field, I'm going to try to excel as much as I could on this even play. Yeah. Wow. That's fascinating, and that's awesome. Did you notice immediately that people started treating you differently after you started doing Taekwondo, or was it like quite a few belts in, and then you started noticing people started I, treating you differently? Yeah. I think it was quite a few belts in, um, mm. and it really started whenever one of the um, African-American kids in my neighborhood would end up taking a couple like weeks of taekwondo and he saw me there mm -hmm. and i think i was like third or fourth belt in um actually no i was green belt yeah i think third belt in yeah mm -hmm. so um and he saw me and like he saw me practicing and sort of like this minor rumor sort of like flew around the neighborhood and stuff and 
then people started giving me a wider berth. Slash, like there were some kids who like wanted to actually fight because like they were like, oh, like challenging you. Yeah, or whatever. of course. And I got that. I was kind of annoyed because I was like, well, I, I didn't learn to like, uh, like aggressively engage anybody. Yeah. I would learn to like to be more defensive. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, the attitudes changed minorly, mm -hmm. um, not as much because there was still like the verbal aspect. They wouldn't, you know, get physical, but they mm -hmm. would get extreme verbal. Of you know? course. Yeah. Wow. Tell me about um, one of your favorite moves that you loved doing and one of the moves that gave you kind of a hard time when you were training Taekwondo. <clears throat> yeah, so I'm not a naturally flexible guy. Um, I still have a hard time doing more like flexible based move. I think the hook kick in Taekwondo was sort of like one of my um, the least favorite moves because it was like especially when you're throwing for the head, it required a lot more flexibility, speed, spinning. Um, I'm not much of a spinner. Mm -hmm. uh, when I spin too rapidly, I, I tend to get off balance. I've, I've gotten a lot better at it, mm -hmm. of course, over the years. But like at first, I just hated spinning because it would throw me off balance. And then sometimes I would get busy if you're told to do like 10 hook kicks in like a minute or something, and mm -hmm. you're doing like drills, right? Uh, <clears throat> yeah, th that was probably one of my least favorite kicks because like it was just a lot of spinning. Um, Weirdly enough, my favorite kick is the uh, the back kick. It, it required spinning, but it was like a more rapid sort of like body shift, just mm -hmm. one one hop like real quick instead of like this full body sort of like haymakers kind of kick. Yeah. Um. So yeah, I got pretty good with the back kick, and um, I I sort of became a little bit known around like the studio for like having a pretty good retreating back kick, wow. sort of like a fadeaway kind of mix in it. Um, cause like still sticking with sort of like this mis defensive evasive mindset, I, I built in this getaway attack that like, I would sometimes bait people into like, you know, follow me in, follow me through the attack and I would wow. clock them in the head with like a return attack. Wow. Wow. That's awesome. And, um, my, my friend growing up who did Taekwondo, he was extremely good at the back kick too. And I just remember yeah. his back kicks would always hit me, you know, he was tall too. So. When I sparred with him, it, it would just, yeah. he, he could do it with both his feet. So, like, he would yeah, just alternate yeah. on me. I'd be like, oh, oh, oh. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I can do that. Yes, yeah. uh, that's actually one of the baits. Yeah. Uh, it's actually funny because that's actually one of, like, the tricks. It's like after the first kick, um, you expect them to be leaning sort of, like, away most of the time, right? Yeah. That's, like, for the bait. So my um, uh, Master Norris, he's the the uh, the – the headmaster instructor mm -hmm. um, told me that if you bait them and like fake like being off balance, you could throw another like back kick with the other leg yeah. and score either a point or like a pretty hard hit because their forward momentum is coming at you. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, you know, you're just whacking them as well. And you're making additional space. So yeah. that was sort of like my go to the double back kick. Wow. Um, wow. Followed by, I don't know, probably a side kick or a step behind side kick. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. Tell me about the first competition you went to. Uh, how did it feel? You know, how many people did you compete against, etc.? So we competed. I competed against sixteen people. So I actually applied for forums and for sparring mm -hmm. because my um, my master, Master Norris, said that my form was looking pretty good and I could enter. Like, pick one of my my best form and I could enter. I could probably maybe place or something. So I was like, all right, sure, I'll practice my form and practice sparring. Um, so I guess. The competition itself, I wasn't, I never really get nervous when I fight people, um, especially sparring. Whenever I put on that gear, like my mind, I sort of kind of like block out distractions, becomes sort of blank, and I'm not really thinking about anything other than like winning the fight. Mm -hmm. So I, I don't think I've really got nervous. I got nervous with the patterns because that was just me. I was not like, you know, there was not an opponent that I was facing, I was facing myself. Mm -hmm. And like, um, Growing up, I was sort of like a perfectionist when it came to a lot of things. Uh, yeah, so I was super nervous when I was doing my forms um, because there was a lot of like upper level belts, people who had more experience doing forms. I think I was only a red belt when I did the sparring competition, so I was like super worried that like the black belts would have all of these like, or sorry, the forms, the black belts would have all these like advanced it's cool looking sort of like fun forms to do and I was doing some more like basic stuff mm -hmm. but um you know I tried my best I did the forms um I think my stances were a little shaky if I remember there was one time I had landed a uh, a jump back hit that like 
I almost like got my leg like almost didn't support itself because I was so nervous. Mm -hmm. But I I did it and I placed uh, second in forms, so that was pretty good. Wow. And then sparring was better. Um, so sparring, so the this, the the, the school I had to it actually it's like it has an umbrella school. I don't know if you've ever heard of Grandmaster Kong, um, from Pittsburgh, mm -hmm. but he is I think he's ninth degree, uh, Taekwondo black belt. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, and he has a bunch of schools around the um. Pittsburgh area and so during in this tournament they basically all came together wow. and like uh I mean everyone's technically like under the same grandmaster but you know you've got your school pride like you've got your school from like area region one like you know and you're trying to like beat region two like you've got all this like rivalry and pride and stuff mm -hmm. so I did uh, um so I did my sparring thing and I got pretty high until unfortunately I had I hit against um one of the young masters one of the um Fourth, young fourth degree back belts. His name wow. was Nick, and uh, I had just basically my the the head master was like, oh, like I got stepped over basically. Mm. Um, so I was like, ah, that's fine. So I ended up getting third, and then he went ahead over me to um, face the like sort of the other school that was really good, and he ended up getting first. Wow. So yeah, that that was my first competition. Yeah. That's so interesting that, um, so you were a red belt at the time and there was a potential that you could have like gone up against someone that was a fourth degree black belt. That's pretty yeah. cool. Well, wow. yeah, they paired it, they paired it by height and uh, weight. That's what it was. So, okay. It, it wasn't by it belt. Wasn't, it was by height and yeah. weight. Okay. Yeah. Cause I, because at that time I was like, I think I was in high school or something mm -hmm. like it was like freshman or sophomore year of high school and i was like pretty tall i hit my puberty stage or whatever mm -hmm. and i was going to the gym and stuff <clears throat> working out so like i was a fit dude so it was sort of unfair if i was fighting like other red belts that might have like started earlier than me and they were younger and like you know like different height levels so they yeah so they match height and weight and because like i was like you know pretty big in like the the, the field like mm -hmm. comparatively to other people and because i like was bulky um then i was actually sparring a lot of adults slash like upper level belts because they were my size yeah wow. yeah um tell me about that competition you had that like you went up against like karate people and like brazilian right. jiu-jitsu yeah. people was that the same or was that a different one no that that was a different oh, that was a more like bigger regional competition mm -hmm. um and i think we were one of three or four taekwondo based schools mm -hmm. and yeah um actually like three weeks two like three weeks before the competition we stopped learning kicks mm -hmm. like we went full on like like we learned a lot of boxing techniques counters upper body counters um clinches a little bit of clinches because even though i, I don't think we were technically like a lot, there was technically like grappling was allowed, but the, um, my head instructor was like from the trend that he's been doing these competitions, not a lot of people did like grappling, a lot of people did strikes. Mm -hmm. So we learned a lot more hand-based upper body stuff. Um, yeah, so we stopped learning our usual kicks and practice, and we just started practicing hand combos, jabs, like you know, crosses, hooks, uppercuts, all these things to like make sure that whenever we face people who could like lock or kicks or like engage us in a way that like we wouldn't we had to fight super close quarters mm -hmm. you know not like 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 leg length and we that we had to fight arm length we would be ready so the competition i think was the hardest because when you're used to like a certain move set mm -hmm. from taekwondo people these are the move sets you're looking for or expecting so it's a lot more difficult when you know so I think my first round was against someone who did BJJ, wow. and I was not ready for the the like the the. So Taekwondo calls it the turn and kick. You hit with the top of your foot, which mm -hmm. is sort of annoying sometimes because it can like hurt you more than hurt the opponent. And then of course you got the BJJ kick, which hits with the shin, right? I was not ready for that like power of a kick, right? So I blocked it, just like how I normally would with my forearm. Mm. Like this that was not the play, mm -hmm. and I I. I lost the use of my left hand literally the rest of the match because that because wow. I I just I was not ready for that mm -hmm. oh, of course so then I think I, I ended up winning um, simply because I <laughs> I don't want to say like not cheating tactics but like my dad because he was trained in Shaolin a lot of their moves 
But a lot of the moves he knows are like very elbow based moves. Mm -hmm. And he had taught me that like during the years, but not like officially. He was just like, you know, try some of these moves to block these type of no kicks. I was like, okay, cool. So I use them against this BJJ guy. I like use my elbow and I use my knee. So the next time he did the the powerful like BJJ kick, I turn and I just ram my knee into his shin. I just turn and ram my knee into the shin, which I don't think is technically legal, but like. I made it, I rammed into his knee and then I chambered into a sidekick. So I did it fast enough that it was, it looked like a, more of a block, but I'm pretty sure I cheated. Cause uh, I, 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 I mean, I lost my arm. So I was like, I kind of yeah. don't want to do what you're like no more. Yeah. So I did that. I hit his knee. I did the sidekick and then he fell over cause he wasn't expecting this sort of fast shift in how I fought. Mm -hmm. So the rest of the match became a little bit more even because he lost his like power kicks mm -hmm. and he, he, I was just dealing with like his upper body, his face and punch combos, mm -hmm. and that was easier whenever I had my legs to work with. Yeah. <clears throat> Did he try to um, grapple you at all since he was Brazilian Jiu Jitsu? <clears throat> yeah, so there he did try to um, grab my leg, mm -hmm. but we actually had prepared for leg grabbing. So as soon as he touched my leg, um, I don't. So Taekwondo has a thing wherever you like can do like a fade away turning kick mm -hmm. I've never seen it it's fake and then you fade away with a turning kick as soon as I felt his hand like touch my leg I switched my body and I did a fade away turning oh. kick and I cleaved him over the head with my foot wow. so like he did catch me I ended up falling but I whacked him really hard in the head and he dropped and I won the round wow dude that's but that, so fast I, I don't think I could ever pull that off I, it just kind of happened mm -hmm. um, I, I think if he like actually got a grip on my leg, I would have lost that round. Mm -hmm. But we had prepared, and I was sort of ready. I don't know. At that moment, I, I wasn't. I didn't know. I wasn't really thinking. Mm -hmm. I just kind of reacted, and I I won the match like that. Wow. Um, I think yeah. one of the most important thing I'm learning from this is that your school is really teaching you based on kind of like what what you're going to compete against or what to expect. They're not stuck in like, okay, we're only going to use kicks against karate or we're only going to use our system against a Brazilian jiu-jitsu guy. It's like, okay, we know what their skill set is. Let's add some more stuff. So yeah. in a way, despite its taekwondo roots and its taekwondo foundations, it mm -hmm. is almost like mixed martial arts, but it's like mixed martial arts with a taekwondo flair almost, kind of like how yeah. you're learning. Yeah, well, actually, the reason for that is if you look at the grandmaster's sort of like history, mm -hmm. um, he did he so he was in Korea. He's Korean. He was in Korea. He did taekwondo, and then he joined the Olympic team back in the day, and then he did sort of like um, MMA stuff as well as he did had practice in boxing and a bunch of other martial arts styles. Wow. And while he, his original route is like taekwondo, he has fought individuals outside of taekwondo. Mm -hmm. So whenever these sort of competitions arise, he basically teaches us to like the level of like, you know, how he would have competed back in the day. So he taught us different things to modify. Cause he said that like, uh, martial arts is like, you know, ever changing and you can't just stick to one system if you want to actually win. He said, if you don't want to win, fine, stick to what you got. Mm -hmm. But if you want to win, you're gonna have to change around a lot of stuff. So that's why I said like three weeks before the actual competition, we dropped all of our kicks. Cause he said like, you guys have all the black belts, you guys have practiced your kicks like, long enough like any additional three additional weeks isn't going to help you what's really going to help you if you it's like these additional moves to fight other styles that you might not usually fight yeah um, wow. yeah so <clears throat> the rest of the competition once i've figured out like you know can they deal with like longer range like leg length attacks if they can i dropped all that and i just focused more on like my hand head movements and like sort of like boxing style like our, our, our um, stance, he said, after you switch from your normal type of note stance, go to a boxing stance. Or like, <clears throat> uh, we did learn a karate stance, but then uh, halfway through the, the, the three week before the tournament, like we dropped that because um, the grandmaster was like, this is not going to work against other stuff. Mm -hmm. So yeah, so we went more to a boxing stance. Yeah. Wow. And so um, after competing against the BJJ guy, how many more people did you compete against? So, uh, I don't know how many people there were there, but I had, I think, eight more rounds. It was spread over, like, a weekend. Oh, so it was, like, okay. Friday, Saturday, Sunday. 
Yeah. So, so there, it seemed like there was some a lot of waiting around. Do you're kind of like, okay, you competed. Okay, sit yeah, around. Yeah, eat some there, food. yeah, there is there is a there was a good bit of waiting around, which yeah. didn't really help the nerves. Yeah. Um, it helped like you know relax and like talk with you know your instructors and stuff. Yeah. Um, even the master instructors were competing too. Our our instructors, they're I think he's a five or six degree black belt. Even he was practicing, and he's like I remember he said. He came back to a match and he was like sweating and his part of his face was like bloody and he was like, guys, I just like fought like one of the like karate like the head karate instructor because they paired all the like head instructors. Wow. He was like, I just fought this head instructor. These are the moves that he uses a lot. I'm gonna bet like ninety percent these are the moves he teaches his students, right? Mm-hmm. So we sat down and he was like dissecting these moves for us between rounds and mm-hmm. that actually helped me win a match against a karate um, style martial artist because I had like sort of like coaching which obviously if you have free time you're going to coach your students so yeah. I'm pretty sure that they got their own coaching too but like it helped me so wow what um, um, yeah. what tricks worked in that match what did the karate guy threw that you're like oh I prepared for this oh right so they so karate has like this sort of like we talk about calls it a thrust kick, but theirs was more of sort of like a very powerful snap kick, sort mm-hmm. of thing, like just very into your gut slash like into the side of your like leg to knock you off balance before throwing a powerful like forward punch or um, even doing a haymaker, one of those roundhouse kicks that they like to do. Mm-hmm. Um, so he said that was the combo that was coming up. That was actually the combo. He he broke down this combo that their the head their head instructor had used was. First kick into the leg, you're off balance, you're expecting another kick to follow up sort of like in this lower body area, right? Mm-hmm. So they bait you with another like attack towards that area. So now you're conditioned twice to protect your mid body right here. So they're gonna throw you that four punch right in towards your chest. So you're gonna so you you're prepared to block here. Mm-hmm. But as soon after they throw that punch, they throw a roundhouse kick. Because now your hands are not conditioned to protect up your head, right? Mm-hmm. So all of the they conditioned you two moves, lower body, no head stuff. Then, quick as a flash, they hit you with a roundhouse towards your head to knock you out. So he said to ignore the second punch and actually fade away with if, – if, if, if he said if they're too close, fade away with back kick. If they're not like close at all, just lean away and prepare like an intercepting side kick. Mm. So if you've ever talked to like someone who does Jeet Kune Do because like – um, I watch a lot of martial arts video back in the day just, mm-hmm. just to help my own sort of understanding of martial arts as well. They have that like intercepting like sidekick that they do. They like to intercept in the middle of a move, which mm-hmm. you, you said, he you said basically intercept their roundhouse kick as quickly as you can. Otherwise, you're like kind of screwed. Yeah. <laughs> because that's a very powerful kick. So I took his advice. The, ki- um, the, the other fighter did the combo. I ignored the punch. Even though it scraped my like arm, like he like wailed my shoulder, it like scored because I leaned back. Mm-hmm. And then as soon as he t- started doing his um, roundhouse kick, I stepped in and I s- did my side kick right to his like stomach. Mm-hmm. But because his leg was like up, right, I whacked like right under his yeah mm-hmm. <clears throat> his leg, and I knocked him off balance. Wow. And so after I knocked him off balance, I you know I like rushed forward and threw like a couple punches and then they pulled me off the guy. But yeah, so that that was one of the things that we helped prepare for. Wow. And I think the match was a lot easier because they kind of like screwed up their game plan, I think. Yeah, exactly. All of them back in the locker room like, okay, all right, we could be. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was a lot easier after that. Wow. And then um, do you remember the last match you had in that tournament? Yeah. Oh, man, the last match – was against one of the rival schools for Taekwondo. Uh-huh. And when I say this dude didn't throw any punches, he didn't throw any punches. Like, I was shocked that you could do that much, like, kick attacks. Like, this kid, I don't think he dropped his leg. Like, there was just this one, there was this stretch of, like, 15 seconds where he didn't drop his leg against me. Wow. I mean, he was an upper belt, but that's no excuse at this point, right? So, like, I'm like, <clears throat> at this point, I was like a single degree black belt, but this was third degree black belt in Taekwondo, mm-hmm. and I don't think he dropped his leg. He was doing 
he was turning kick, turning kick. Oh, now it's the other leg. Now the other leg turned into an axe kick. And then all of a sudden, the axe kick drops, and not, he's doing a hook kick. So I only stayed in the match because we had practice sort of like <clears throat> boxers. So I'm yeah. ducking and weaving. Yeah. yeah. Right, and part of me is saying like, just whack his leg. Like this is sort of like, like right. one of those Jackie Chan movies where you're yeah. just punching the leg. Or yeah. the, but you know that was illegal. I was like, shoot, what do I do at this point? So like, he was confusing me so much that like, <clears throat> he got a turning kick into my head that I barely blocked. Mm-hmm. Like, I when I say barely blocked, I like I basically my hand whacked myself, so mm-hmm. I, I ended up still hurting myself. So like, he whacked my head. I went like this, but as soon as I keeled over, his other leg somehow came over this side and just whacked oh. me up. Which is, he went boom, and then he turned and whacked me again. And then at that point, I was on the ground. Um, I sort of kind of wanted to him to tackle me on the ground, but he literally just told me to get up. <laughs> I think he knew his own weaknesses. Yeah. Um, so he didn't engage me on the ground. We did practice a little bit of grappling, but not too much. So I don't, I don't even think I could have won if I really tried, because like I was too winded. Mm-hmm. You know, I think he still would have gotten the exchange if we, we played a ground game, but he didn't. He just waited for me to get back up, and then he ended the fight by uh, hook, doing a hook kick to the back of my head. Wow. Ugh. Ugh. He did not throw a single punch. It was terrifying. Yeah. It was like <laughs> I didn't know what to do at that point. Wow. And when I asked my master, he was just like, "Yeah, that kid's got." way too much like speed and power on you i don't think you could have done anything wow. and i asked him like i was like what if i had like you know as soon as he did a turning kick and i just whacked him with my elbow and then my, t- <laughs> my master was like you can do that on the street right no. you can't do that. <laughs> <laughs> i was like i was like ah damn. why did they ban like um a forearm and you know like a fist and elbow hits the leg what was the point of banning that i i, I think I think it was because, like, even though, like, like some of the um, Brazilian jiu-jitsu stuff, right, um, they did have elbow throws and stuff, like, even, like knees and stuff. Um, they banned, like, basically, like, intentional sort of, like, breaking of, like, opponent's, like, body parts, I think. So there, there was this rule where it's sort of, like, you can block, but if you're intentionally trying to, like, hit somebody's arm or leg like that's not allowed because like we weren't using like feet guards or feet pads or something Mm -hmm. and i think like even though like it was sort of it wasn't like the octagon sort of thing right it wasn't even though there were different styles together we had gloves um we had like sort of we had like very tight chest pads it was different like they gave us these very tight chest pads but they just didn't give us any like leg pads i don't know why Mm -hmm. they just ran like using these techniques because they were like a, like there's still like parents watching the ground. It's like, mm-hmm. like you can knock somebody out be, to kick the head because there was like padding there, mm-hmm. but like they didn't want, like any sort of like broken bones kind of thing. I, I it was get not, it. Like, yeah. Yeah. Liability. I, I, they, I was, they don't want to. No, they don't want someone's no, legs no. snapping and then yeah, they're getting yeah. sued. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't like an MMA sort of thing. These were like all still like students within these schools, and they were. It's still a business to an extent, but like it, they were still kind of reaching towards that MMA sort of like thing. Makes sense. Yeah. Um, which then um, jumps to my next question. Around this time, I, I assume you were getting close to your black belt, right? Yeah. Um, do you still remember the day you got your black belt, what it felt like? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, it actually was a little bit stressful because, A, I had to learn all the meanings of the patterns, and I had never studied that. <laughs> and there was like... 12 different patterns and I had no idea what they meant mm-hmm. and they were like each of them would have like a paragraph length that you had to know them exactly wow. so that was the one thing I was nervous about but there were sort of like feats of strength like um we had to do a step behind side kick through I think seven or eight boards like wow. those like one inch boards um so that was rough on um, my like I hit the gym pretty hard for that mm-hmm. um just to like you know, get leg strength up. Um, there was also, you had to fight against one of the masters, either um, someone your size or uh, someone like that's a new master. Basically, there, there, there was a set of masters that had only been a master for about like a month or so. Mm-hmm. If they were shorter than you or not, you know, if they were not the same weight as you, then you basically fought taller people. But unfortunately, I ended up fighting my friend Nick and this kid is pretty phenomenal at sparring. So basically you had to fight this person for two minutes 
and uh, not have a point deficit of more than two. Mm. So it was like, and they were told to just basically go nuts on us. <laughs> we have to both defend ourselves and like, you know, keep up this point deficit. Yeah. Right. Um, so sparring, you've got the breaking, and then of course you have to do all of the forums, know all of the, like, um, the meanings of the forums. And then finally you had to, um, know all of like the tenets of Taekwondo as well as like the, you know, the ethics behind everything. Um, so yeah, so after I did all that, the hardest part was fighting Nick because Nick is really, really fast and he actually won his division at the at the mixed martial arts one tournament, the one where I like dropped and like I lost. He beat the kid that only kicked. Mm. Um, and he, he beat him pretty 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 greatly actually. Like mm-hmm. he uh he ended up grappling the dude like twice and like throwing on the ground so it was pretty awesome. Wow! But so I, he I, managed. I to, he surpassed the guy's kicking range. Went in. Boom! He, yeah, no, the he guy surpassed on. the guy's. He actually. Well, he didn't really surpass. He let the. That was the thing. I was. I should have let the guy hit me. Mm-hmm. I didn't. I tried not to get hit. Like always. Like it's sort of ingrained in everybody's mind. Is you don't want to ever get hit. Yeah. But Nick let himself get hit, so that he like went through the leg. Mm. And the leg kind of like crumpled up a little bit, like retreated, because instead of like. You were expecting the person to go fly, but Nick just bulldozed through and then grabbed the guy. Uh, so that, that, I think I should have done that. I think I might have done it, but yes. So he surpassed that guy. And mm-hmm. So I had to spar Nick um, for two minutes, and that was kind of hard because not only can Nick kick sort of like the guy, he's not as good as the other guy in terms of just constant kicking, but he also had like punches and counters and like grapples too, right? There was this moment where he got me into a chokehold and I had to like get out of it. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, so after two minutes in that sort of like sparring setting, um, yeah, I, 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 after that finished like and I got through it, I was given my black belt. And that felt really nice because like it took a while. Yeah. yeah. How many years did it take? Um, I'd say like six years. Wow. Yeah, that, that sounds standard like a. A legit Taekwondo school from the people I've talked to. It's like six to seven years, six to eight years to yeah. get a black belt. So, guys, so for viewers of Fight Come Two, we're talking to another legit black belt. You know, there's this association with, especially karate, kung fu, and Taekwondo. There's so many McDojos. I can tell you definitely didn't go to a McDojo. Oh, no. I don't. We, well, we, luckily, this, I did not go to McDojo, but there were other Taekwondo dojos in sort of like the surrounding Pittsburgh area that were McDojos. And, mm. We fought those kids, and we all shook our heads after we fought them. <laughs> well, it was kind of embarrassing, because, like, aside from, like, you know, you've got, I've got my umbrella school, yeah. the, which, which all, the Grandmaster Kong is no, like, fake. Like, yeah. he's really serious about his martial arts and Taekwondo. Yeah. But then there were other, like, just all Taekwondo tournaments, and we did fight these sort of, like, as you said, McDojos. Actually, I've never heard them call that, but, yes. Interesting. McDojos, right? McDojos. And, and it basically the the tournament ended up just being our school versus one of the other schools that were rivals, like one of the under the umbrella of the same math grandmaster, right? Mm-hmm. Like all the other dojos basically lost, and we were just like, well, I guess we're just fighting each other again. <laughs> <laughs> we were like, wait, we're just fighting each other again. Wow, yeah. that's that's so interesting. So like it took, took six years. Yeah. Did um all those people that like the the McDojo people you fought? Did, did you guys, like, talk to them afterwards and just try to understand them? Or was it more like, okay, all right, we don't want anything to do with you guys? <laughs> we, we didn't talk to them, but mm-hmm. the, uh, our Master Norris, our head instructor, he did. He was, he, like, pulled a couple of their black belts aside, and he was like, look, guys, you guys got to shape up if you want to call yourselves black. We, we, I kind of heard the, like, the, at the beginning of the conversation because we didn't, like, I mean, our eavesdropping is bad, mm-hmm. bad, but we also didn't want to gossip. Mm-hmm. So we kind of like heard some of it, but he, the essence of what we heard, or at least the, from my eavesdropping, was like, you guys got to shape up. This is not, like, you can't call yourself like Takono, like black belts yeah. this way. You can't, you guys couldn't like keep up with like some of the red belts that were your size, like red wow. belts and like yellow belts. That were your... There was a yellow belt who did extremely well. He was like a super tall middle schooler. Like he must have hit his growth spurt super early. But he was facing like black belts from the other schools, and he was creaming them. Wow! And we were just like, please. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So that yeah, yeah, it was it. I felt kind of bad because like they they were just not up to par really. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Wow. 
that's fascinating, and it's really big props to your master Norris for trying to at least reach them and be like, hey guys, so maybe there's something you guys need to work on. That's awesome. It's like kind of like a exchange of ideas, but not like rude or anything. It's like, guys, um, there's some things we should consider talking, fixing, yeah. etc. I really like that. Yeah, he Master Norris was a very, very good teacher. Um, he he is excellent at forms and sparring. Um, but his so <laughs> funny story. He married his wife, the other head instructor. Mm -hmm. So they're, it's now a family business, basically. But mm -hmm. yeah, he and his wife, they all teachers. His wife is really, really good at forms and patterns. Mm -hmm. But after a pregnancy, she like put on a little weight. Like wow. now she can't really be at her peak, so she doesn't really spar anymore. But she still corrects us in technique and stuff. Mm -hmm. But Master Norris, like. The last time I went, all he ever did was teach sparring, mm -hmm. and he would, I, I un, unlike other some of the other schools from like what I talked to them, um, those other McDojos, they never fought their master. But like, if there was no kid my size, I always fought Master Norris, like all the time, and I got handed my ass handed to me constantly. Mm -hmm. But that got me, you know, I got a lot better because of that. But yeah, yeah. yeah. And there were just some times whenever all of like. You know, the college students are doing college stuff, right? Yeah. And I was like a high schooler, so there was nobody there, and it was just, I have a little brother, but yeah, he's 16 now, but so, yeah, so like there would be, like, at that time, there would be like middle schoolers his age and his size that he could fight with, right? And then I was, you know, there, there was nobody in my belt level, nor my size, nor my skill level, so I ended up fighting Master Norris wow. all the time, no pads, no nothing. Wow. <laughs> and wow. getting the shit beat out of me. Yeah. Yes. I think um, one of the signs, if a place is a McDojo or not, is you look at the one of the headmasters, right? Do the headmasters fight? Do the headmasters train? Do the headmasters yeah. look like they got like a twenty pound like, beer gut? There's like, yeah, there's like a sort of swag. Like there's sort of like a vibe to them. Like you can look and be like, oh, he definitely a works out and b yeah. like has martial arts experience. Like looking at Master Norris, you could definitely tell that. And a lot of the masters from our um, like the other schools under our umbrella, they look like that too. Master Yi. Oh man, that dude is amazing. Master Yi was really good. Mm -hmm. Master Norris, Master Beck. So a lot of the masters, I think his name is Beck. Mm -hmm. Yeah, a lot of the masters were excellent. Mm -hmm. We did have some like, dojo like masters, but they weren't. They always got shuttled off towards more patterns as opposed to like sparring. All the masters who like solely did sparring or like did a lot of sparring teaching, mm -hmm. they were like really good at sparring. Wow. Like, really, really good at sparring. Wow. It's awesome, man. It's it's like the, the first guy I talked to doing Taekwondo. Now you, like, we talked to some legit Taekwondo people. This is really exciting. And I know my audience is going to really, really enjoy um, hearing your story. My um, my next question is, and this is probably the second to last question for me, is that, right. mm, so you're a second Dan in Taekwondo. You're a second degree right. black belt. Tell me about getting the second Dan. How is that different from getting your first Dan? Um... I think so. The the only it, it was very similar. Um, still, you had to learn all the meanings. You had to go through all the forms in the past as well. Um, but I guess the biggest difference was like you had to spar longer. You had to keep a one point deficit mm. instead of a two point deficit. Uh, you had so spar longer one point, and then they added two more boards to your stack. So I was kicking. I think I said, yeah, I was kicking like nine or ten boards basically mm -hmm. so i had to break all of them or like i would fail and i'd have to wait like six months like i would have to wait basically to get my belt again so that was very stressful um yeah i, I think in terms of like is it harder yes um is the system any different no it, it, there was no there were no surprises mm -hmm. it was just like it's like whenever you're playing mario and like the next level was sort of like the previous level, but they're like more like more like you know bosses and yeah. more like little like minions you had to kill. That mm -hmm. that was essentially it. it. It just got harder. I think if I had, I mean, if I had gone to college in Pittsburgh instead of in Philly, I would have continued. And when you get to fourth degree black belt, black belt, you fight some another. You fight a head instructor. Mm. So you would be fighting Master Norris, Master Yi, whatever, like one of those guys. So that that's that would have been extremely difficult. Wow. Like you had to win. You had to have more points. You had to win basically. Wow. Um, wow. And then there were a bunch of other requirements too, such as like breaking boards with elbows, fists, palm strike. There was like, and then you had to break like I think three or four boards per hand strikes. 
and then you had to still break, I think, 10 boards for the side, step behind side kick, and then you had to do a couple things, like the hook kick, axe kick, back kick, and snap kick. So yeah, it was basically, they just added more stuff that you had to be able to do mm-hmm. on, on top of everything previously. Wow, wow. First of all, again, congrats being a second Don. That's a great achievement. <laughs> um, where do you think martial arts is for your future? Do you think you might teach a little bit on the side or maybe you'll just go back into it full time? Or what do you think? Because you know, you're going to a prestigious school. When I went to Penn, it was like the number fifth school in the world. But I don't know I what so. it's ranked now. You know, The ranking's kind of rigged too probably, but it's yeah, a really yeah. good school. <laughs> it's a really good school. Um, what do you think martial arts is going to be? Like, you know, I managed to make it my career in a weird way. But, like, where do you think it's going to be in your kind of, like, journey in life? I'm going to be honest. It's kind of depressing, but I want to go into the biotech industry, mm-hmm. and I want to really use my engineering degree. You know, I'm a bioengineer by major and I've got engineering entrepreneurship as my minor so I also want to work in a startup at some mm-hmm, point right mm-hmm. so I don't I feel really sad to say but I don't really know where Taekwondo will be outside of like you know I go to the gym like this is my like you know arm day leg day now this is my cardio plus martial arts practice day yeah. right like I don't I don't think it's going to expand outside of that because it's it was really hard keeping up martial arts in at Penn um Part of it was A, classes, and the other part of it was, I mean, I didn't like any of the, the club taekwondos at Penn. Mm-hmm. They didn't do nearly enough sparring as I wanted, of course. so I just dropped all of them. So I um, that's I also joined a boxing club, and they actually did a lot more sparring. But, yeah, it's just really hard, I think, now that like I'm trying to get into the real world and I have to get an income and feed myself and stuff. Yeah. So Brilliant. I'll say just practice to keep remembering what I remember. Um just practice to stay healthy and be able to defend and protect myself. But outside of that, I'm, I'm not sure. I don't think I'll be teaching. I don't think I'll be going back into full time unless I like, unless I get a very solid nine to five, but sort of like the jobs I want with like startups and stuff, it's kind of hard yeah, <laughs> to exactly. keep like a straight nine to yeah. five. So what, it's very what, unfortunate. What started my channel, Fight Commentary Breakdowns, was because I was working at a startup. I was there for so many yeah, hours really? that like this became like a side hobby at the job. So I know exactly really? how it is. Startups, yeah. man, you have no life. So Yeah, so yeah. I, I, I don't know. Maybe in the future, but right now I'm looking like it's a no. Yeah, yeah. Outside of just like working out. And I think it's, it's like that's – everyone's martial arts journey is different, right? So that's cool. That's awesome that yeah. like – you have this bioengineer type of thing you want to do, and our world needs more of that, especially, I mean, look at what we're under yeah. right now, right? So, like, we need that kind of stuff. So, it, it, and in a way, that's like you, all the martial art journey you had in middle school, high school, and stuff, and at Penn will help you on your startup journey, on your bioengineer journey, because when faced with a lot of the same kind of challenges and stuff, you'll remember, oh, I've gotten past horse. I've been hit in the face and I got past it. What's what's a little bit yeah. of this going to do to me, right? Yeah, that's right, yeah. Yeah, so like the martial arts journey, no matter what's going to benefit you um, in the long run, and of course, your body's just going to move differently. So like you said, like on the street and stuff in the future, even years down the line, you're still going to like have a different kind of swagger than most people. So very few people are going to mess with you. <laughs> Hopefully, yes. That's the hope. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So um, your brother, it sounds like he's still training. Uh, yeah, he's still training, but he's hitting the uh, the junior grand year, you know, oh, of high man. school. They take so a lot of that... AP classes years. Yeah, yeah. Stressed yes. out AP year. classes, SAT prep, even though all of that is a wash now with the coronavirus. But yeah. Yes, yeah. he he was taking a lot of AP classes, SAT prep. Um, you know, trying to get like internships at the University of Pittsburgh for like cancer or whatever. So like mm-hmm. basically all academic stuff. Wow. Um, he would go like I think two or three times a week. But yeah, he has been really practicing. Actually, it was very shocking because in the past we always nicknamed him um, Grasshopper because the way he kicked was sort of like <laughs> sort of like a grasshopper. Uh-huh. He just kind of like kicked okay. really strangely. Uh-huh. Yeah. But then uh, I like we had a fun little like just sparring match with our gloves. Like, I think last week, because we were kind of bored mm-hmm. <laughs> outside, and he got a lot better. I was actually surprised. He clocked me. I was like, not ready. I was like, wait, I thought you were bad. <laughs> but he got a lot better. You yeah. know, he got significantly better. But, yes, yeah, so uh, he's been sort of going down the same path. But from the way it looks like, it's uh, he's he's aiming. He wants to go to Stanford. Wow. So. Wow. <laughs> 
it's that, yeah, it's kind of hard to like go to Stanford and also train constantly like I did back yeah, in the day. Yeah, exactly. So. Well, yeah. um, let's wish your brother luck on his his academics, and then um, <laughs> um, guys, for those of you watching fight commentary breakdowns, if you, I'm sure Richard has a lot of knowledge that will come out in the future. So if you guys have any questions or anything for him, I mean, you can ask about Taekwondo, but if you, I guess they can ask you about bioengineering too, if there's anyone. Oh, no. I can't, I'm a senior. Oh, okay. I, can, I know a good bit about bioengineering. Yeah. Okay. Four yeah, so years. Total they, four years. They can <laughs> ask you about bioengineering if they wanted to. I mean, yeah. I'm assume since it's fight commentary breaks, most people will ask you about Taekwondo, but yeah. I can definitely bring Richard back in the future. I just called, I just called you Richard. I'm so sorry. Oh, Ryan, Ryan right. I'm definitely, no, I, I interviewed another guy named Richard the right. other day. Gotcha. Um, I'm, I'm definitely going to bring Ryan back in the future. If, if he wants to so yeah leave your oh, questions yeah. and i'll bring them back in the future awesome yeah thank you um yeah just i guess for anybody who is doing martial arts just keep training keep at it um and even if you know you gotta have to put it to the side because of school or work it's always gonna be there yeah for you exactly i think that's a great ending message it's always there like i i stopped martial arts in high school and I didn't do it at Penn either. Like, I had an eight-year kind of, like, not doing martial arts at all. But then I eventually got back into it. So don't yeah, ever yeah. feel like, okay, well, I haven't been doing it for a while. I can't ever do it again. It's always there for you. And that's what Ryan... It is always there. Yeah. You pick it up really rapidly. Um, yeah. Like, I sort of didn't really do it sophomore year and freshman year mm -hmm. college. Um, and then junior year, I, like, picked it up again. And I, I still had I still remembered a lot of what I remembered and, like... You know, even if you're like, oh, I haven't done this kick in like two years, it, the muscle memory comes back pretty rapidly. Yeah. yeah. From what I've experienced. Yeah. Exactly. Exactly. I think the key is um just go and train and just get moving. And I yeah, know it's it's harder that's... under the current environment, but you know when, yeah. once this lockdown's gone, you know go go support your gyms because a lot of them unfortunately are probably going out of business. Yes. Yeah. A lot of gyms are having a hard time. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I saw, I saw my old boxing instructor, and I would just ask him. He's like, nobody's there. Yeah. You know. Yeah. yeah it's yeah. really hard. My um, one of the Brazilian jiu-jitsu schools I would film. Like, I'm pretty sure the husband and the wife both like that's their full-time gig, running that BJJ school. And yeah. you know, they have a baby daughter. They're about to have another daughter. Wow. So it's just that's like, yeah, yeah. Like, especially he's a great person. He's a great instructor. So it's just like, um. If if you can afford it, just like keep your membership in his place. Like I, a lot of gyms were saying that. Like if you can keep your membership now, and then once this is over, you know they'll reward you with more class or whatever. Like do that because if you don't, yeah. a lot of those schools that you enjoy might not even be around by the time yeah, this is over. Yeah, yeah, they lose rent. Yeah. yeah, rent is a problem right now. It's a huge problem. Yeah, it's crazy. Yeah. It's crazy. But um, you know, we got Ryan here. And um, in the future, being a bio engineer, we'll ask him. Maybe we'll bring him back in five years, maybe on a different yeah. channel or on a different platform. If, if, if you have any questions, yeah. um, tissue engineering, cancer, neuro engineering, all that. Wow. I, I went through all that for school, so yes, mm -hmm. I can answer those questions too. Cool. Okay, guys. Um, I'm going to leave it here. Ryan, we can talk a little after this. So I'm going to stop recording oh, yeah. now. My commentary breakdowns out. Every one of you share this. Share this with your bioengineering friends too, in addition to your martial arts friends. <laughs> okay, guys. Yeah, awesome. Thank, Thank you. you, Ryan. Um,